we're going to be talking about monoclonal antibodies, a new way for the future. So let's see here. These are my disclosures, which are also be listed in your program over here. And so when we're talking about waves of the future, we're talking about treatment paradigms in uh, multiple myeloma. And the paradigm that I'm showing above is very much what's been in ingrained into us of induction, transplant, and maintenance. And of course, we have these um, subsidiary questions at each step along the way. Um, but you know, now that we have this new wave of new drugs coming in, does this paradigm get turned onto its head? So you all know the story of the rapid pace of drug development in multiple myeloma, um, starting from a thalidomide in the late 90s. Um, quite a few drugs approved within the last few years, four within uh, the last year, um, that are presenting a uh, plethora of uh, options for us. And this means that more are coming. So if you take a look at this comic over here about a uh, groom about to marry his bride, he says that, as you can see, by late next month, you'll have four dozen husbands. Better get a bulk rate on wedding cake. There will be many, many monoclonal antibodies and other new drugs uh, for the use of multiple myeloma, multiplying our options. So we have two approved for use right now, elotuzumab, which is the anti-CS1, and daratumumab, which is the anti-CD38. And in development, um, some of them later than others, is atuximab, lorbatuzumab, and indituximab, each with different targets. And so when I first was first presented with um, this, this talk um, and um, the subject, I was wondering whether you know, this really was the wave of the future. I was thinking about rituximab and the hybridoma that uh, Kohler and Milstein developed in 1975, um, which is a little revealing, but a year before I was born. Now, fusion of multiple myeloma cells and B cells from a mouse spleen uh, were created after the mouse was exposed to an antigen. Um, these hybridoma cells were, were thus able to produce a monoclonal antibody in excess directed towards that antigen. And the first lymphoma patient was treated in 1982 with a monoclonal antibody. Um, so, you know, the past is the future and the future is the past. Uh, rituximab, uh, first used in 1993 and approved in 1997 which was um, a year before I graduated college. And so uh, I was thinking about back to the future. Doc, don't you understand? It's 2016 in most parts of the world. Great Scott Marty, we have to find a way back to the future. Um, so we're, myeloma is now sort of catching up to lymphoma in terms of antibody use and development. Um, the reason why the antibody development in myeloma has been a little bit delayed compared to lymphoma is that many antibodies have been tried before in myeloma, and as you can see here uh, from the table, very few of them have had or led to meaningful responses. So when we're talking about multiple monoclonal antibodies for use in treatment of cancer, um, there are many different ways in that a monoclonal antibody could work. Um, and we'll go through um, each of them um, over here. Uh, one is the CDC, which is uh, cytotoxicity mediated through the complement pathway, complement uh, directly binding to bound antibody on a cell surface leading to cell lysis. Then we hear about ADCC, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, where antibody coats the target cell and an effector cell, like an NK cell, for instance, will come over and lyse um, the offending cell. And then ADCP, which we don't hear as much about, which is antibody-dependent cellular uh, phagocytosis, in which an activated macrophage will do the same thing as the NK cell, come over and um, lyse the offending cell. And in addition to that, um, you know, sort of innate property of antibody cellular cytotoxicity, we're, all, we're also developing antibodies that are conjugated either to uh, radioactivity um, or perhaps uh, to prodrugs that lead to poisons that enter inside the cells. Um, and also, um, we have antibodies that are uh, linked to other poisons, such as microtubule inhibitors. So the first antibody, of course, you're familiar with is elotuzumab, which is anti-CS1 or SLAMF7. 
um, enlutuzumab, um, humanized monoclonal IgG1 antibody targeting CS1. And as you can see here, CIS1 is highly uniformly expressed on 95% of primary myeloma cells. Here's some plasma cells in the cecum. I don't know how they got there, but they're there. And they stain uh, for the CS1 over here. Plasma cytoma is very heavy staining. Uh, if you took at, take a look at a um, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, there's a little bit of staying in there. Uh, and so you can readily determine um, SLAM F7 on the surface of plasma cells. SLAM F7 is also on the surface of NK cells. And you can tell in this slide that there are two mechanisms by which elotuzumab has an effect um, in multiple myeloma. One is the um, elotuzumab can bind directly to SLAM F7 on top of a myeloma cell, and this attracts an NK cell, leading to myeloma cell death. This is ADCC. The other is that it directly activates the NK cell itself, um, hyperstimulating it to go and find myeloma cells to kill. Um, and, you know, it was mentioned before in this conference that um, immune regulation, turning on NK cells, turning on NKT cells, are, um, we have many different pathways to achieve that, elotuzumab being one of them, the immunomodulatory drugs being another, the checkpoint inhibitors being another. And so we're beginning to learn how to use all of these uh, new biologics and technologies uh, to our advantage. So in the eloquent two trial where elotuzumab was combined with uh, lenalidomide, we see that um, although there was a higher response rate for the um, elo uh, lenalidomide dexamethasone arm as opposed to lenalidomide dexamethasone arm, what is really the most dramatic finding in this study is the sustained progression-free survival two years out of 41%. These are relapse patients. And so to give a patient after a relapse or two a therapy and having 40% of your patients not progressing at two years is actually quite an achievement. We saw, again, earlier in this conference that a multiple relapse patient has an expected survival of around nine months, especially as they get beyond the third, fourth line of, uh, of therapy. So this was published in the New England Journal. When you combine elotuzumab with uh, bortezomib and dexamethasone as well, that also showed that there was an improvement in progression-free survival. This uh, a little bit um, less dramatic on the order of three months. Um, however, this, this trial um, data is still being uh, collected. On to daratumumab, which is the anti-CD38. So CD38 is found um, on many different cell types, um, including um, lymphoid cells, natural killer cells. It also happens to be expressed on red blood cells. We'll, we'll get back to that later on, also on smooth muscle. Um, and it's not, uh, in terms of malignancies, it's not exclusive to multiple myeloma. It's also seen in uh, lymphomas, um, B-cell lymphomas, uh, TALL, for instance, AML, for instance. Um, and in CLL, we know that CD38 expression is a poor prognostic marker. So daratumumab was generated as a monoclonal antibody, um, binds to CD38, and uh, purportedly destroys myeloma cells through all the mechanisms mentioned before. Um, it also interferes with calcium metabolism and calcium signaling in myeloma cells, which is another purported mechanism of action for daratumumab. As a single agent, um, daratumumab did show activity in multiple myeloma. Um, funny enough, elotuzumab did not show um, any um, PRs or better when used as a single agent, but in that particular phase one study, 26% of patients did have stable disease. So when somebody says that elotuzumab has no single agent activity, well, it, it may, uh, but it may require that extra kick in NK cell activation. Daratumumab has definite single agent activity. Um, in this study with a median of five prior lines of therapy, DARA as a single agent had overall response rate of around 30%, progression-free survival a little less than four months, and a one-year overall survival rate of 65%, which is, which is also quite amazing. Um, only 4% of patients needed to discontinue due to adverse reactions, and that's been borne out in further studies uh, that most people can tolerate um, daratumumab and elotuzumab, most of the reactions are infusion related and most of them occur during the first exposure to the drug. In this study over here, also important, no patients developed anti-dara antibodies. So we do worry about this sort of um, thing occurring and perhaps um, neutralizing the drug, but um, 
I guess, unfortunate for the patient and fortunate for the patient, pa patients with multiple myeloma do not have good antibody responses uh, to antigens. Um, people did have URI symptoms in 21% uh, of them, none of them grade three, and I, I find this too in my own practice when um, I, I'm giving DR2 MEM for the first time to the patient. One of the more, more common um, side effects that we encounter is rhinorrhea, uh, runny nose. Um, and so they classify that as URI symptoms over here. It is recommended to give uh, zoster prophylaxis and pre-medications for these potential infusion reactions. So um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in this study. This is the CASTER trial, which was combining daratumumab with bortezomib and dexamethasone. This trial has been um, all over the place uh, in terms of presentations and conferences. It, there's a poster uh, tonight, uh, which you can stop by at. This is a large phase three trial of um, DVD versus VD in uh, patients with relapsed myeloma. Um, this is the schedule of dosing over here. And uh, multi-centered multi, uh, center design, uh, mostly patients in their 60s. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the rate of deletion 17 over here was around 15% and 12%, so pretty much what you would expect in the population. Patients had myeloma a little bit less than four years. Most patients were on their first uh, relapse. However, the majority did have prior proteasome inhibitor, prior stem cell transplant, you know, similar to other phase three trials in this population. So there was a higher response rate for the daratumumab, bortezomib dex arm as opposed to bortezomib dex, this is expected, more drugs are better, of uh, 80% versus 63%. And 19% of these patients with relapsed myeloma were able to get a complete remission. This is the real punchline of the trial, progression-free survival. The progression-free survival for the control arm was 7.2 months. However, for the treatment arm, the DVD arm, it was not reached. And this hazard ratio is 0.39, uh, which is one of the lower ones that you will see. Here's a tip for you. If somebody asks you what the hazard ratio is in a myeloma trial, say 0.74. You will be right more than half of the time. But 0.39 over here, so meaning that was very statistically significant. Time to progression followed the same pattern over here as well. And this held up whether you had one prior line of treatment or multiple lines of treatment. Of course, with one prior line of treatment, the hazard ratio gets even better. However, as you go on to later lines, the hazard ratio is still there, but it drops down to a 48% benefit. So um, this is an argument, perhaps, that you may want to move monoclonal or, uh, antibodies closer to the start of therapy. Similar study that was just presented here, probably an updated version of this presentation uh, for the abstract award. Uh, this is the Pollux uh, study, um, and again, um, not reached median PFS for the, for the DARA lenalidomide dexamethasone arm as opposed to lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Now on to antibodies that have not been approved yet. Um, this is uh, SAR650984, also known as isatuximab. This is another monoclonal antibody against CD38. As a single agent, it does have activity. Uh, at a dose of 1 mg per kg, PRA 24%, 10 mg per kg, 33%. Um, there is some dose response relationship over here, and it has all the mechanisms of action um, as for daratumumab, which makes sense. So, in a phase 1b dose escalation trial of isatuximab plus lenalidomide dexamethasone and relapsed myeloma, if you take a look at this, this population over here, 31 patients, median seven prior lines of therapy. So this was a very creative treatment group that kept on coming up with new therapies for their patients. This was presented at ASCO 2014. 95% had prior IMID, 85% refractory to an IMID, and then you have an overall response rate of close to 60%. So again, a very heavily pretreated population. This is a uh, combination trial with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and they seem to play nicely together. There's updated data from a phase two single agent isatuximab trial that was presented by um, Dr. Richter at uh, ASCO um, that looked at different dosing schedules uh, for the isatuximab every other week, um, every other week, then every month, every other week at a different dose 
continuously and then weekly and every two weeks. So they tried every which way. But the interesting part of this trial is that 30% of the patients involved in the study were quad refractory. Um, so just a couple of years ago, we invented the term double refractory. And now we're using quad refractory. So the field really is moving forward. Quad refractory means refractory to Len, Palm, Bortezomib, and Carfizumib. And if you take a look at this interim response data over here, we're actually seeing meaningful responses in these patients, um, especially at um, a higher doses or a more intense dosing schedule. Um, and so you're seeing responses. So the overall response rate was 24.3% was, um, over here. Um, but you know, in terms of patient disease characteristics, uh, there was good responses in people who were older, greater than 70, decreased renal function, high-risk side genetics, prior transplants, more than three prior lines of therapy at a 24% response rate. And I remind you that this is a single agent drug. So this really could be a lifeline for your quad refractory patients. If you take a look at the progression-free survival, around four months um, over here, and the median overall survival, 18.6 months, which again is quite remarkable um, in a very sick patient population. So more agents in development. Uh, MOR03087, this is a, another CD38 um, that has greater EDCP activity. There's lorvotuzumab, uh, which is an anti-CD56 uh, conjugate to a mi microtubule um, inhibitor, DM1. A uh, single agent study, you had a clinical benefit rate of 46%. And then in a phase one with LEN and DEX, over a response rate close to 60%. However, like anything uh, expected from a microtubule inhibitor, there are uh, reported, reports of peripheral neuropathy with the use of this drug. Then there is indituximab, uh, which is a CD138 monoclonal antibody conjugated to DM4, which is another microtubule inhibitor. Uh, single agent stable disease rates of 52% with some skin toxicity seen. And then phase one with Lendex, overall response rate around 80%, which is exciting. Um, you know, so, sort of non intuitive because CD138 is known to be shed. Um, however, still um, response rates over here. So challenges of monoclonal antibodies um, are presented over here. Uh, and we'll go um, through several of them, the first one being um, interference with RBC compatibility testing, interference with immunofixation, and interference with CD38 detection by flow cytometry, which Dr. Ely had mentioned before. Um, so our colleagues in Amsterdam had shown um, that if you take um, a patient's serum sample that had been exposed to daratumumab, the daratumumab will coat the RBCs. There's CD38 on top of these RBCs. And then when you give an anti-IgG reagent, as we would for, for blood typing, what you get is agglutination with no matter what you put in there. If you have daratumumab and other irregular antibodies, this simply amplifies that effect. However, if you give a patient with daratumumab an anti-daratumumab uh, wash before you type their red blood cells, then you have no problems. However, if they have irregular antibodies and you give them the wash, you will still get panagglutination. So essentially, you know, when you're going to do blood testing on your patients and daratumumab, you have to tell your blood bank. Um, if your blood bank is still having trouble, um, then a, phenotype, a phenotypic blood type um, can help you out in that situation. Uh, but this is something that's becoming more widely known. And not surprisingly, monoclonal antibodies, IgG kappa monoclonal antibodies, such as elotuzumab or daratumumab, can interfere with reading of serum protein electrophoresis and immunofixation. Here's an example of a patient who has an IgA lambda type myeloma. There's the M spike, and you can see the immunofixation over here. The patient at cycle 34 on elotuzumab now has a faint. Uh, G kappa band, and the, the challenge is, is this a subclone of the multiple myeloma, or is this in fact picking up elotuzumab and the immunofixation? And you can see that um, the investigators here in the gel actually made an elotuzumab lane, um, and it lights up with a band over here. So we know that the, that elotuzumab is interfering with the testing. And so um, this can, interfere with our ability to determine whether a patient is complete response or not. Uh, it helps if your patient was originally IgA lambda, 
and then they get a later IgG kappa, you can sort of assume that it's elotuzumab. However, if they start out with IgG kappa, which happens to be the most common subtype of multiple myeloma, then you have a problem, and you may have to resort to testing like this or marrows with, with other sort of techniques. And so future plans for monoclonal antibodies, move them closer to the frontline setting. I'm all for that. There are clinical trials underway. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, another thing that may make sense is using it as part of a pre-collection or part of a transplant regimen, uh, so-called in vivo purge. Um, certainly we've done that with transplants for lymphoma, using R beam instead of bean. Um, in terms of MRD testing, we know that the um, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies can interfere with MRD testing when done with flow cytometry, um, and so we have to think about that. Um, it seems to make a lot of sense to use these for maintenance post-transplant. Um, given that they're, uh, for the most part, not myelosuppressive and uh, with very tolerable toxicities. And then uh, the question of whether to move this into sort of a preclinical uh, setting like smoldering myeloma. This slide is from last year. But everybody's so concerned with 2015. What about 2017? The Running Man is coming in 2017. That's when the movie was set. And I'm sure that there is uh, much more to come in uh, 2017 and beyond. Thank you.